Brothers in Arms by Honoré Roncalli. Fifteen days after our older brother Giuseppe died in the war, my twin, Giacomo, took his own life. He'd always been the most delicate of us, and the war had hit him harder than most, but he was still happy. He still knew how to have fun. No one had expected this. No one had heard his tears in the middle of the night, the strangled cry of him choking himself with his pain. No one had heard him chanting fervently to himself every spare minute, prayers for mercy, prayers begging the Lord to save him. No one had seen that fraction of a moment where his face crumpled and his eyes cleared as he shed the mask he wore to achieve a semblance of normalcy, shed his mask to reveal his true self, a shadow of the man he once was, being swallowed by the inferno inside. No one except me. Giacomo had a habit of saving people. He saved me from countless fights when we were young, and he saved my life countless times on the battlefield. Batista, he would always say, nothing is too broken that it can't be fixed. I would always laugh him off, him and his crazy ideas. What about that mirror? I would ask. If I were to take that mirror and break it into a million pieces, you would be able to put it back together? But he would always just smile at me like he knew something I didn't. He was always doing that. Although we were the same age, Giacomo was ahead of me in practically every sense. His brain blazed hot and bright like a star. You could still see for millions of miles away. Mine, on the other hand, smoldered, still burning, but unable to give off heat. Our mother held big dreams for him, away from Sotto del Monte, away from us, away from everything we knew. Specifically, she dreamt of priesthood, the greatest honor that could be bestowed on any family. Shining hypocrisy glittered rather seductively with the hope of promise and with hope in the promise of salvation. Giacomo didn't share these dreams, however, something that frustrated her on end. He was happy at home, figuring out how to wake, make wine the fastest or the best uses for our money. And then, of course, when we were 13, he met Elvira, and Mother lost all hopes of priesthood for him after that. Before Elvira, it had been Giacomo and Battista, the two brothers who were practically joined at the hip. Before Elvira, we had been each other's protectors, each other's homes. We were the one place we both belonged. After Elvira, it was no longer Giacomo and Battista. It was Giacomo and Elvira, and then Battista after that. After Elvira, suddenly Giacomo belonged to more than one place. Suddenly, he belonged to Elvira, too. And somehow I, too, was locked on to this girl who had taken myself for me. You don't have to worry, Battista, Giacomo told me one night, after I expressed my concerns about Elvira. You'll always be my brother, my other half. I didn't bother saying that I'd heard him whisper in Elvira that she was his other half, too. Nonetheless, Elvira's presence grew on me, a small but stubborn tree that took root in our lives with the intention of staying, and by the time we were fourteen I could see why Giacomo was drawn to her. I was dragged along with them wherever they went, seeing as Mother would have nearly died from of shame from the impropriety of it otherwise. The only reason both Mother and Father agreed to it at all was with the hopes that they would be seen as betrothed since Elvira was rich, and we needed the dowry for our vineyard. When we were fifteen, Giacomo confessed to me that he wanted to marry her, that nothing else in the world made him as happy as she did. She burns my heart, he whispered to me one night. It burns my heart when I think of her, but it feels right. It feels like she's burned me into actually existing, and the burning makes me feel like I'm finally real. I didn't know what to say to that. When we were sixteen, he proposed to her in secret, and they cherished any spare moment they had alone together, brought to them by me, a rather dull horse that never seemed to delight them as much as the package it left behind. So they met more and more frequently, for longer and longer amounts of time, completely disregarding the fact that I was always running out of excuses. And yet, these meetings felt rushed, as though they knew that their time was running out. After all, the Great War was still plowing forward, a train without brakes, manned by the Grim Reaper himself, leaving behind a trail of exhaust in its wake, eating up those behind it, stopping at every station to pick up the next passengers on the journey to death. Giuseppe himself had been called aboard already, along with most of the able-bodied men of the village. Prayers were always being uttered to save those that were left behind, a rather hopeless task, for the prayers of mere men mean nothing to the whims of powerful deities. When we were seventeen, we found ourselves boarding the very train to the whims of powerful deities. When we were seventeen, 
we found ourselves boarding the very train we had hoped to avoid. Words don't exist that can describe the agony of warfare. Try as I might, I can never describe it. The words always waiting on the tip of my tongue, but vanishing without a trace the moment I try to speak them. They're trapped inside my mind, banging incessantly on the side of my teeth, in my skull, in my brain, and my everywhere, like the sound of glass shattering when it hits the floor. The sound that sparks a feeling of loss, as you know the mirror can never go back to what it once was. That now all you can do is clean up the leftover shards. I can never escape it. It's always there, whether it's a lake or a pulsing feeling that makes me want to scream as loud and as long as I can, pushing it out until finally it leaves my body. And so I don't speak. I don't make a sound. I hold it in as it kindles my recklessness, my need to escape, my need to be anywhere but here, anyone but myself. I soldier on with the hopes that one day I'll be free, that one day, by some miracle of God, the mirror will be put back together again. Giacomo and I never talked about the war. Perhaps he wanted to, and sometimes I felt as though he did, when he looked at me with his long eyes, staring me down as he silently screamed for help behind his mask. I always looked away. It was too hard to see the pain in his eyes. But maybe he didn't want to talk about it either, and I had just been imagining it at all, hoping that I wasn't the only one who felt this loss. Yet, maybe if I had turned to him back on one of those nights in our bunk, Maybe if I had tracked him down after dinner or before bed and taken him by the arms and shook him until he gave in and told me why, told me how he was feeling, told me anything. Maybe if I had, he would still be alive. But maybe not. Maybe that wouldn't have changed a thing. Maybe Giacomo would have trudged along in the same manner until he finally gave in to the comfort of death, the comfort of nothing at all. After all, we no longer feared, feared eternal damnation. The world we lived in was a, already a hell, swallowing us whole with its flames of darkness. Giuseppe's death was the beginning of the end. We had lost our older brother, the man we looked up to. On the train ride home for the funeral, Giacomo never uttered a word. He stayed seated in the same position the whole time, his eyes tilted out the window, looking but not seeing as the world passed him by, as I tried my best to console him. After a week of not talking to me or Elvira, he finally called to me one evening. Batista, he said, I need you to promise me something. His eyes were ablaze with recklessness and hunger, and for the first time in my life, I was afraid of my own brother. Anything, I replied, although it made me somewhat uneasy, and I had a feeling this promise would not be something simple, but something that would make me squeamish, the feeling of having swallowed something rotten. He turned to me. Marry her, he said. If I die, I need you to promise me that you'll marry her and look after her. There was no debating this we. We both knew who he meant. I didn't bother saying that he wouldn't die either, for we both knew, deep down, in the depths of our souls, where we never cared to wander, that he would, that this would be a promise to him that I had to keep, the one promise that would ever truly matter. And now here I am, a few days later, sobbing, lying next to his body, a gun in his hand, and a sh shattered mirror nearby, scattering broken pieces all about, the sun reflecting off of them, creating some sort of halo of light around his head, a piece of paper in his hand. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It was never supposed to be this way. Let Elvira know that my love for her will always burn a flame in my heart for the rest of her life, even though I'm gone, and tell Batista that he was right about the mirror. This would break them. This would break everyone. The shame, the pain, it would all be too much. And so I got up and moved Giacomo's lifeless body to a chair, positioned the gun just right. It had to be believable. I turned toward the fire, its flames looking at, at the air around it. I took a clumsy step towards it, then looked back at Giacomo. I moved towards the fire quicker, this time with purpose, stood in front of it staring it down as though it were Giacomo, staring it down as if to say that maybe I was wrong, maybe he had been right about the mirror after all. I took one last look at the letter before crumpling it up and dropping it in, the flames devouring it in mere seconds. I walked out of the shed and into the light, burdened by promises, burdened by death, burdened by secrets. Nobody needs to know. <laughs>